Hi everybody, I hope you're safe and well. Welcome to another Chats with Children. Today I'm delighted to join by Aaron Lamb and John Bardsley, who are from Thermo Fisher Scientific. And today we're going to be talking about nitrosamines. I have to pause when I say that. By a bit of a tongue twist right. for that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nitrosamines, I've got it right. Okay, so John, Aaron, how are you? Lovely to see you guys. Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for, ha thanks for having us on the, uh, on the, on the podcast. It was lovely to see you both. Anyway, so which part of the UK are you calling in from then, John? We're both around the corner from each other, actually. We're just outside of Manchester. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a United fan and I'm very upset about last night's results. So we won't talk about that now. Though. We'll just move on. <laughs> Don't look <laughs> <you're> on, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on anyway. So before we start talking about nitrosamines, could you just give people a very quick background <laughs> on your sort of experiences and, and your roles and also a little bit about Thermo? Sure. Yeah, maybe I start. So, um, yeah, so Thermo Fisher Scientific is the world leader in serving science. So we essentially provide instrumentation, service and support to a whole plethora of different scientific um, operations and, and um, organisations, you know, spe specifically around um, life sciences. Fantastic. And your background, John? Yeah, so extensive in Chet and Buried. So um, I started life as a, a lonely bioanalyst in the pharmaceutical industry. So I spent many years, over a decade, in fact, at various large pharmaceutical companies, um, went from the bench into method development, et cetera, and really kind of honed down towards um, liquid chromatography, mass spec techniques, and a lot of sample preparation. Um, spent some time in the CRO world as well. I was assistant laboratory manager um, in a little place in Manchester for a while where I had my first kind of a uh, few people working for me. And then I was been with Thermo for just shy of seven years now. Most of the time was spent in applications in our chromatography and consumables group. Um, so really kind of getting hands on with the equipment and making sure methods are robust and fit for purpose. Um, and then for the past year or so, I moved into our marketing group. So I'm a vertical marketing manager in the pharma and biopharma group. Fantastic. And Aaron? Yeah, so I'm similar background. So, you know, analytical chemistry is sort of the forefront. Um, I, I've got a degree in chemistry. Um, went to uh, work in industry uh, for Intertech, Pharmaceutical Services Manchester. And, and that was mainly dealing with, you know, pharmaceutical analysis and QC sort of environment. Um, and then I've worked at uh, Thermo for five years, mainly in like uh, application roles. So GCMS application specialist, also on LC as, as well. Um, and I also work in John's team now. So I've been there for the last uh, four months. So, yeah. Excellent. Cool. So let's talk about nitrosamines. I'm going to say this so much, it's going to fly off my tongue. So the first question I've got for you is... What are they? How are they formed? And how do they end up in pharmaceuticals? Good question. So, yeah, nitrosamines are very they're small molecules, right? But they're very, very toxic. So they, they're carcinogenic and the presence in pharmaceuticals is, is dangerous for, for, for our health, basically. Um, so how do they form? So they're formed mainly through... Um, reactions involving um, the nitrosium ion. So this can come from uh, nitrite that might be present in pharmaceuticals. And, and when that reacts with secondary amines, that's when the formation of nitrosamines happens. So um, how do they get into the pharmaceuticals in the first place? So there's a number of different ways. So there's through that formation mechanism, but also they can be introduced through uh, contaminated raw materials um, and, and various other other ways as well so um it's really important that we analyze for them to make sure that pharmaceuticals are safe right john you got anything to add to that yeah as, as aaron said they're very toxic molecules so they're, they're classed as probable human carcinogens so any exposure above the acceptable limits for any lengthy period of time you know obviously increases the risk of cancer so it's incredibly important that we can accurately measure and, and, and control these compounds right and obviously what do regulators request though in terms of nitrosamines? I'll let you answer that, John. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I guess the regulations around these have, have evolved over the past couple of years, right? Um, we'll start from you know a few batches of specific uh, specific drug products, and, and now moved on much more widely. So really, what the regulators are asking for is a much a very broad testing strategy. Initially, any drug product that's destined for human use needs to be have, have at least a risk assessment right so it needs to be assessed for the likelihood of any nitrosamine presence if it's found that there's a chance that there may be nitrosamine presence that's where testing strategies have to be implemented um, so th this needs to be a kind of batch release style test where we, we make sure that there's um, a real control of the nitrosamine compounds in there there's a, a short list of, of 
really interesting kind of nitrosamines, means, but it can, you know, some, some of the regulation wording suggests that we can look for much widely more nitrosamines. Um, and within those regulations, there's, there's, there's um, acceptable limits. So we need to make sure that all nitrosamines are below these acceptable limits across every drug product that gets released, right? Which is, if you think about it, the scale of that is humongous. So if there's potentially nitrosamines in every drug product you produce and you've got to test every single one that goes out, that's a huge scale. So, and that's part of the problem. It's not necessarily just uh, the, the, the problems with nitrosamines themselves. It's how do we accurately and continuously monitor these? Right. And I know this became an issue, particularly in the sort of scientific press a couple of years ago. I mean, lead, before the pandemic hit, there were so many stories about nitrosamines and, uh, you know, there's a lot of webinars coming out about mm. that. So why was why did it happen then? Uh, it was such big news then when it wasn't before. Well, well, I think the, the very first one was um, due to contamination of um, drugs called sartans. Right. So these are these are used to treat, you know, like high blood pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so they, they were detected. De they were detected in valsartan, losartan, and anerbasartan, those kinds of uh, drugs. And really, you know, they, they, no one was aware that they actually existed in these products, probably because they weren't tested for them in the first place. But um, so then, you know, then that came to light. So the, the EMA and also the FDA set a two-year transition period, and basically pharmaceutical manufacturers had to test all of their pharmaceutical product lines and and to do risk assessments as john was saying and yeah so it's it, it's still very very current but i think um you know as as they've gone through the portfolios now that it's quite clear which you know which so, sort of drugs um can lead to the formation so another class of drugs is metformin um and i've actually got a webinar that i'm delivering next week so on <laughs> on a new method using the uh, gc high res for, for metformin analysis so um yeah we're keeping it current <laughs> <laughs> anything to add to that john um no i think i've answered that very well yeah it's um you know there's certainly certain drug products which are absolutely you know in the limelight because they've been found to contain it already so there's a there's a, a genuine you know kind of nervousness around that so i think that's where a lot of the testing started happening but the, again the testing strategy is quite broad everything needs to be looked at it's not just we found it in metformin so we'll only test metformin yeah it was, it was you did you did say metformin didn't you so i mean metformin is for diabetes as well so it's obviously a very i mean uh, a very popular a very widely used yeah well I, popular maybe not the right word for it when you're talking <laughs> about drugs but, yeah, but you know what i mean in terms of widely used is a good better term maybe so you talked about testing so what are some of the methods out there to test for nitrosamines and what are their advantages and disadvantages yeah okay i think we've probably both got something to say about this one so why don't i start um, so, I mean, nitrosamine analysis isn't that new. It's been around for a while, in you know, particularly in food products, for example. But now it's been monitored for in drug products. We really have to think about the appropriate technology. So, the difficulty here is sensitivity. Right. So, you know, you really need to be able to see to have some very low levels. A lot of these drug products that you that you might take, like metformin, you may be taking them daily for a very long period of time. So, that's a potential to build up. So, we need to be able to monitor the very low levels. Um, because of that, mass spectrometry has become the front runner in this particular analysis type. Right. Um, you know, it's become the gold standard, um, mainly because of sensitivity, but also because of selectivity. There's there's a few well-known case examples where the um, the drug products or the formulations themselves contain other interferences that might are so closely related to these nitrosamine uh, compounds that they may actually cause interferences and give you either false positives or just or, or give you issues with ionization in the source, for example. So right. um, sample preparation alongside some form of separation like liquid chromatography, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry have become, you know, the, the gold standard there. Um, that said, there are some variations in there. A lot of the methods that first came out that were recommended by the regulatory authorities, they focused around high resolution mass spectrometry for some very good reasons. You know, having that level of selectivity to kind of mitigate against some of these interferences is, is absolutely a must. Um, but on the same side of the coin, uh, tandem um, triple quadruple chromatography as well, uh, sorry, mass spectrometry as well is, is you know, a very, very good technique here. Um, very robust, very high sensitivity um, and you know, once you've kind of ascertained that there's going to be no issues from selectivity on the, on those systems, it's a it's a great kind of in, it's a great uh, instrumentation to take forward your high throughput capacity testing. So when you're kind of you know thousands and thousands of samples, you can just let them run. 
Right. Okay. And yeah, I'd say okay. from from my side actually. So when when we when they first started testing for nitrosamines, there was only two. So there was NDMA and NDA, and a lot of the early FDA methods were centered around GC uh, headspace analysis because right. you know these these low molecular weight nitrosamines are very volatile, so they could be analyzed by by headspace analysis, but over time, uh, and due to the risk assessments and the evaluation of products, the, if the, the FDA have increased the scope of the nitrosamines only you know, a few months ago to, to seven now. And a lot of these are higher molecular weight, so they're less volatile, so not, you know, not headspace GC amenable. So there's been a definite shift towards uh, LC methods as well. So a lot of the later uh, methods have been LC high resolution mass spectrometry for the reasons that John alluded to, um, because a false positive can mean a batch recall, which to a pharmaceutical manufacturer, uh, manufacturer is like a, you know, the ultimate <laughs> nightmare, right? Um, but, you know, LC isn't the only way you can analyze these compounds. And there are a lot of new methods that are coming out on the GC side as well, um, which um, can give better separation. So a lot of these nitrosamines are isobaric in nature. So you need to really uh, separate them chromatographically uh, in order to you know quantify them and, and not overestimate the compounds so um so yeah there's a multitude of different techniques but triple quadrupole mass spectrometry is definitely uh, a good uh, choice strategy for doing screening um but we pro we recommend the use of high res in the result of a of a positive result so to give you the ultimate confidence basically so right okay and i've heard that uh, right, itidine cannot be analysed by GC. So is that correct and why is that? Yeah, so ranitidine, I think this was last year that the, the health scare came out and they actually withdrew ranitidine from the market. You've probably used it before after a, <laughs> a heavy night on the town, uh, perhaps, because it, it helps with um, in, indigestion and, and you know acid reflux. But um, a lot of the analysis that was performed at the time was by GC Headspace and under high temperatures, uh, ranitidine actually breaks down and it forms nitrosamines. So um, there was, you know, there is nitrosamines in there, but it wasn't at the, the, the freakishly high levels that people thought. So, you know, that's when the FDA brought out the, the LC high res method for ranitidine only. But um, out of all of the, the drug products on the market that are currently tested for nitrosamines, that is the only drug product that I've heard of that uh, can't be analysed by GC directly. That's not to say you couldn't employ a different strategy such as solid phase extraction and do it, do it by GC if you wanted to. But I think for, say, you know, for a peace of mind and ease of use, it's probably best to do you know, LC on, on that particular compound. Right, OK. So... That's all we've got time for. So how can people get more information about this very interesting topic and obviously a very important topic? Yeah, well, I suggest they visit our webpage, our dedicated nitrosamine webpage, which is thermofficiate.com slash nitrosamines. And um, in addition to that, you'll find some information about some webcasts, webinars, and some conversational pieces that we've actually start this month in May and go on throughout the year. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for first of all telling me how to pronounce nitrosamines properly, because that's always a good start and uh, talking more about the issues around it. I mean, it is a genuinely interesting topic and someone who is not a scientist is actually. But obviously, I've actually been pres prescribed metformin, but I haven't taken it yet. I've had it in my drawer for about two years. I've not touched it yet. So I keep trying to think I'll do my diet and not start and it yeah. the medicine. Uh, it does make me make me think, well, actually, it's good that you guys are on the case with your instrumentation as well. So so that's fantastic. Look, thank you very much. Um, I will put the links above to the upcoming uh, webinars and roundtables that you've got coming. So people, if you are interested in knowing more, as John and Aaron quite rightly said, there's loads of information there on the website, uh, on the Thermo website, but they also have got their own series running where you can also see these lovely gentlemen, interact with them and ask them questions directly yourself. So I would recommend that. So John, Aaron, thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend. It's lovely to see you both. Thank you. And as always, thank you very much for watching. As I say, check out the links above. Sign up for the uh, for the webinars and so on. They're free. And if you've got any questions actually before then for John and Aaron, feel free to put them in the comments below the video because I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. And you can message them directly on LinkedIn as well as they're both active on LinkedIn as well. So thank you very much again, gentlemen. It's lovely to see you. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, until next time, stay well and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.